Hello everybody and welcome <coughs> to another edition of Zog Science. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the cell membrane and sort of the things that are going to be going on at the membrane. Uh, so, you know, the title of the slide is Cell Boundaries, so we're talking about kind of the space in between uh, the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell and what goes on there. So the cell membrane, okay, remember all cells are surrounded by a thin flexible barrier. We call that the cell membrane. So prokaryotic cells, eukaryotic cells, they both have this. And it is responsible um, for to control what is entering and leaving the cell. And it also some, provides some support and protection. Um, and the cell membrane is composed of a double layer of lipids called the lipid bilayer, and that's very important. And what you'll notice is that the lipid bilayer is composed of kind of two portions. We've got a hydrophilic portion, okay, and then we've got a hydrophobic portion. So hydro is water, philic is love, or philios is love. So hydrophilic means that this area loves the water. Hydrophobic, phobia is fear, so the, this part fears the water, doesn't like it. So what happens is that the, um, the lipid bilayer automatically arranges itself into this shape right here, where the um, the loving water loving parts are on the outside, okay, and then the uh, water fearing parts are on the inside. So the uh, water uh, <clears throat> that's why it's called lipid bilayers because you've got two of these molecules right next to one another, okay, but they rearrange themselves such that the part that does not like water is on the inside, which makes sense because you remember your body is made up of 70% water, so there's a lot of water, so they kind of point at one another, meaning that there's really no water kind of in this area in the center here. Um, and another kind of important thing to note is that if you look here, this is a more accurate portrayal of the whole cell, uh, of the whole cell because there's actually proteins and carbohydrates and lipids that are found within um, the cell membrane. It's not just only the the lipid bilayer. There's actually lots of other things going on, and those are important as it pertains to the function of the cell membrane. Uh, so yeah, we got those proteins and carbohydrate chains. So the cell walls, um, those lie outside the cell membrane, and they are found in plant, fungus, and prokaryotic cells. Uh, their main function is to provide support and protection, and the cell walls are made from carbohydrates and proteins. Plant cell walls are mostly cellulose, and fungal cell walls are mostly chitin. Uh, and this is kind of an up-close picture uh, using an electron scanning microscope of what a cell wall of a plant looks like um, made out of that cellulose. So transporting materials, okay, how does a cell do this? Okay, we have two processes called active and passive transport. Uh, so we're going to talk about passive transport first. So we have this um, we have this thing called diffusion. Okay, it's the tendency of particles to move from an area where they are more concentrated to an area where they are less concentrated, or what we call down the concentration gradient. So if you look at this animation right here, what's happening is that the on the left side of the screen we're starting out with a higher concentration of particles, and on the left side a lower concentration. And over time, the two are going to balance each other out. And how this happens is that where you have a higher concentration of particles, those particles are zipping around, moving and bouncing off of one another. And when they do that, they want to spread out and get away from one another because they keep hitting into each other. So what they do is that they go through the membrane, the cell membrane, to get to the other side where there's less particles bouncing off of one another. And eventually you get to the point where it's equal. And when you're at this place where it is equal, we call that an equilibrium. And once you've reached equilibrium, it doesn't mean that it no longer keeps bouncing and moving back and forth because they do. So in equilibrium, what's happening is that the particles are actually going to continue to move back and forth across both sides, but they're going back and forth at an equal rate. So again, we call that equilibrium, where they have two uh, equal concentrations. And again, the diffusion depends upon random particle movement. Okay, And uh, the diffusion across cell membranes, therefore, does not require energy, because it just requires the fact that the particles are moving around, and molecules automatically move around on their own. Um, something that you may not have known is that temperature is actually the measurement of how much the particles or the atoms and molecules in a substance are moving around. So when you take your temperature, you're really measuring how much your particles are moving around. And that is what we call heat, but it's actually things moving around. 
Uh, we all also know what, so based off of diffusion is, okay, osmosis is a special type of diffusion where it is just the water molecules. So diffusion is the random movement of particles across a membrane to reach an equilibrium. Osmosis is the, special, is the random movement of water molecules across a membrane to reach equilibrium, okay? And the type of membranes that are gonna occur with osmosis are what we call being selectively permeable or semi-permeable because they only allow certain size particles to go through. So your cell membrane is a selectively permeable membrane in that it only allows small particles to come through automatically, whereas other things are unable to come through easily. Um, so uh, we've talked about this a little bit before, but in a solution we have two things. One is the solute and the other is the solvent. Water is almost always the solvent because it is what does the dissolving, whereas the solute is usually what is being dissolved. So if you look up here in this picture, okay, the solute cannot pass through these holes in the membrane because it's there. These holes are too small. Um, so the solute can move through, or sorry, cannot move through, but the water, the solvent can. So if you look. There's more water molecules on the left-hand side than there is on the right-hand side, so they're gonna move through to the other side, okay? And that is osmosis. So the water molecules are diffusing across to, in order to equal out the concentrations, okay? The solute cannot move across, so therefore it, it's not going to be reaching equilibrium. The water, however, is going to move across so that it reaches equilibrium. And what this can do is this can actually cause the water levels to rise on one side and decrease on the other side because the water will move across in order to reach that equilibrium, which is pretty cool. So here's sort of a little um, animation that talks that's going to show this. So there's this, um, the cellular membrane, okay? And what you see, again, is that the water molecules are highly concentrated at the bottom and they are gonna to move to the top in order to try to reach an equilibrium so that there's an equal concentration leading to a net flow of the water into the cell. Now, what is that gonna to do to the cell? It's gonna cause the cell to kind of swell up and get larger. In uh, animal cells, this can be a problem. If you put animal cells into pure water, um, like distilled water, you can actually cause the cells to burst because they will continue to take in water trying to reach equilibrium and the cell membrane will eventually burst. Plant cells, because they have the cell wall, are not going to burst when you add in, when you put them in pure water because they don't, um, they don't have this problem because they've got the cell wall to help hold and provide that structure uh, and support. Uh, another type of passive transport is facilitated diffusion. Um, so this is going to help these larger particles like glucose uh, and other solutes be able to diffuse. So what happens is that, remember, the membrane has these proteins, okay, and we specifically we call them protein channels that make it easy for certain molecules to cross, okay? And the channel is specific for the molecules it allows through. So it's kind of like how enzymes are specific to certain substrates. Channels are specific to certain um, molecules. And again, facilitated fusion does not require the use of the cell's energy. It does not require um, energy in order to happen. So what, how this would work is that here's our glucose, and again, this is just kind of a representation. It's not, they don't look exactly like what the glucose looks like. But here's our channel protein. So the glucose comes in, it binds, okay? And so what's gonna happen is that when it binds, it's gonna change the shape of the protein. We call that a conformational change but it's gonna change the shape of the protein so that the, the protein now is allowing the glucose to pass through. When it releases, okay, the, the protein is gonna change its conformation back into the original shape. So when we talked about this before, that temperature and pH can change the shape of proteins. Well, certain proteins are built such that when a, another molecule binds to them, they change their shape. And in this case, your cells, your cell membrane takes advantage of that in order to help allow these molecules to come through. But again, this just has to do with random particle movement. So the glucose molecule just has to randomly run into the, um, the channel protein. Once it binds with it, it's gonna allow the glucose to move through to the other side. So here's just kind of a little video, another little animation showing you what that looks like. So every time that the 
uh, molecule binds with the protein, it changes its shape and allows it to leave the cell or it could be entering the cell uh, either way. So active transport. So we just talked about passive transport and the theme with passive transport is that it does not require energy. Okay, Passive transport does not require any extra energy from the cell. Active transport, however, does require energy. Okay, So this is going to occur when cells need to move things against a concentration gradient. So passive transport is moving things with the concentration gradient from high concentrations to low concentrations. In active transport, we're going to move moving things from low concentrations to high concentrations, and this requires energy, and particularly energy in the form of ATP. And we'll talk more about ATP um, in our next um, next little video. But ATP is all is what you need in order to do energy. All right. Um, so what's happened is that we have these little um, protein pumps, or there are um, there's another there's a couple other forms that we can use in order to move things across the cell membrane. Uh, and larger molecules are going to be using endocytosis or exocytosis in order to um, be able to move materials across. So uh, this is kind of what the protein pumps look like. There'll be a little video up here that you can watch. But what happens is that we use energy in order to move the material from an area of lower concentration to an area of higher concentration using uh, something that is related to a protein channel. But again, it requires energy in order to, to make that occur. Uh, we also have endocytosis. So this is where large molecules are, are basically transported into a cell, so endo you're going to be moving it into the cell and what happens is that the cell membrane kind of folds around the molecule and forms what we call a vacuole or in a lot of cases it's called a vesicle but it's essentially a vacuole that is holding onto the um, onto the molecule okay remember we talked about before that um, vacuoles are membrane bound organelles okay so this is the cell membrane kind of pinching in and pulling that molecule in all right, so this is kind of what it looks like. There are three different types of endocytosis. I'm not <coughs> expecting you to know those three types. I just kind of want you to understand the general concept. But they all work the same way, where you kind of have this pinching occurring, forming a vesicle on the inside of the cell that is containing whatever you are trying to transport into it. Uh, we also have exocytosis. So this is where the large molecules are actively transported out of the cell. So endocytosis bringing it in, exocytosis exiting it out. Um, and during exocytosis, the membrane, again, it's of the vacuole or the vesicle, basically kind of fuses with the cell membrane and forces the material out of the cell. So again, here's that kind of what it looks like. Here's our Golgi apparatus. It's producing things, right? Remember the, the endoplasmic um, reticulum, either the smooth, smooth or rough ER, are producing things. They're sending it to the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus then packages it and is going to send it out into the into the um, extracellular material. So it does that through exocytosis. All right, uh, I believe that's all we have for this lesson. I will see you all next time.